Hello and welcome. Now, due to the length of the book and me going deeper than I would have originally, I will be breaking this into three parts and covering the main graphic novel and it got reprinted not long ago as the Blackest Night Saga. Now this is because it would be over an hour long and I can't talk for such a long period without becoming a stuttering idiot. 20 minutes is a struggle for me too, so this is why I tend to do a lot of short videos. It's also a reason I have a YouTube channel, so I can kind of overcome this stutter. So, when Marvel Zombies was first published, it was not long until DC replied with their own take on the superhero zombie genre. There's a few differences between the two. Marvel Zombies brought in the Walking Dead writer Robert Kirkland. The, main, the story of Marvel Zombies is more played for humour and follows the superhero zombies around from turning to conclusion. Marvel really made it less about the surviving the zombie apocalypse, but it was more about the superheroes coming around to the fact they are now zombies. It also started as an alternative universe to the usual Marvel 616 universe, only later to become canon in the third volume of paperbacks, when the virus made, well it's not actually a virus, it's kind of magic as well, but we'll say virus because it's easiest that way, well the virus made the trans-dimensional universe jump and became part of a 616. Now Blackest Night on the other hand was an event storyline, so it also had a lot of tie-in comics too. The main story, the one I am looking at in this series, was written by the superstar writer Jeff Johns, and it was art by Evan Rice. This was during his Green Lantern run. Blackest Night is not played for humour at all, and it is borderline a horror comic at times. It is also canon from the start, taking place in the main DC universe. Now we start with, well, two prologues. The first prologue, the tale of the Black Lantern, is about the origins of the villain William Hand, aka the Black Hand. Born into a wealthy family that owned a morgue, his family was petitions, and this was how young William became obsessed with death. His family considered him a little odd, he saw psychiatrists, and there was little more than the Williams family could do. His life was to change when he got caught up in a fight between two Green Lanterns, Hal Jordan and Sinestro. The post Red Lantern, Red Lantern Atrocicus as well. The soon to be Red Lantern dropped a device that William believed mimicked the power of the Green Lanterns, and but it killed. He created his own outfit out of body bags, becoming the Green Lantern villain, the Black Hand. After a series of battles with Green Lanterns, it looked like his criminal career would come to an end when the spectre turned his hand to ash. So he couldn't do much evil with one hand. And he got abducted by aliens. <laughs> oh my god. I, I just have to laugh at that point. That is actually what happened. He got abducted by aliens he called gremlins. And they restored his hand. Now, whatever he touched died. But he could hear the voice of what he, was believed, what he believed was death. He took the alien device to his family home, killed his family before turning it on himself and taking his own life, only to be resurrected by Scar, the Guardian, and becoming the first Black Lantern. Now, of a second prologue, Death Becomes Us, brings us in the two main heroes of the series, or two of the main heroes of the series. It's got quite a few. It's Green Lantern, Hal Jordan, and the Flash, Barry Allen. Hal Jordan is looking at the grave of Batman and his parents and Batman's grave is a blank gravestone. Hal Jordan uses his time to explain what has happened to since the Flash was lost to a speed force, explaining which heroes were killed and in some cases how they were killed. Like Martian Man had his murder by Dark Side followers, Batman's death by the Omega Beams and his own fall from grace becoming Parallax. What the two friends were unaware of is they had led Black Hand straight to Batman's grave. Part 1 starts out at Batman's grave again, with Black Hand finishing digging up the Dark Crusader's body. He's talking about how death comes to everyone, something his father would say to him. This was the reason the Black Hand killed him, to prove his father right. Yet he alludes to how a superhero empowered community it is rarely a permanent state. The Black Lantern rings are deployed by the Black Lantern power battery in Sector 666. But now we head to Coast City. I've got to admit, when reading this book, it does jump around quite a bit, so I'm doing this as the book is written, so expect a lot of jumping around. 
as I said, we're off to Hipco City on Earth. It is a day of celebration and mourning. It is the date that Superman died, but seeing as he came back, they celebrate the heroes who risk their lives every day. And not just the superheroes either, the police, firefighters and paramedics. Everyone who makes it their life to save lives. The Green Lanterns are doing a flyover the city with the Air Force as part of the celebrations. We get a, an internal monologue from Hal Jordan on how they are lucky for being alive and the deaths of his that shaped their families. Hal Jordan's father, John Stewart, dot saving Kat, Kat Matui, Carl Rayner finding his girlfriend folded up in the fridge. And then Hal muses how only Guy Gardner got the happy ending when his girlfriend Ice returned. How many other human Green Lanterns may be envious of this? The Green Lanterns separate them all in their own way, and we see the individual characters are going to be pertinent to the story, mourning at graves. Superman, Superboy and her adopted mother, Martha, is at Jonathan, Con Jonathan Clark's grave. Jason and Professor Stein at Ronnie Raymond's grave. Even the rogues have their own graveyard that is hidden, where they drink to their fallen friends. The Teen Titans have a mausoleum, and of course we have the third party which includes the Atom Smasher. The Atom Smasher doesn't want us have anything to do with this and he can't even look at his own father's gravesite, saying dating he can't even look at his own face. Mira is at Aquaman's grave while telling Aqualad why he should remain on land. Alfred discovers Batman's grave has been desecrated. Finally, the Flash learns about the attempted theft of heroes bodies that was thwarted by Nightwing and is forced all the bodies to be moved to a secure area. The Flash demands Hal now to show every single hero who died and this actually forces the Flash to sit down. Well, we're still on part one here and like I said we jump around a bit and we've got the Atom and he wants to speak to Hawkman about his wife, Jean Loring. Jean Loring killed Sue Dimney, the wife of Plastic Man. This causes Hawkman to destroy his phone he's talking on so the Atom cannot travel down the line and talk in person. Hawkman's rage is less about the death of his friend, his wife, more the woman he is destined to love forever and love him in return, and she refuses to acknowledge the emotion. The reason is that if she died, if she did I should say, they would both die. After this we learn the guardians of the Oa are worried about the war of the lanterns. The different lantern cores are all fighting, causing issues around the universe. When one of, of her own, but Scar, she learns that the Guardian hearts are useless because Guardians no, feel, no longer feel emotion, as they believed they were rude to all chaos and they had and it had to be controlled. So she is quickly beaten back. And just as this happened, the Black Lantern's rings reach the graves of the dead Green Lanterns, and they all rise from the dead. Not just the Green Lantern's graves, but all the graves of heroes and villains alike. The attack of the dead begins. The first real casualties we see are of Hawkman and Hawk Girl by Sue Dimney and Plastic Man. The Black Lanterns chose their victims on their own emotions, because they need these emotions to power the Black Lantern rings. They see the victims in the colour of the emotion that they are most linked to. Hawkman is red with rage and Hawkgirl is the violet of love. Once they have defeated their targets, the Black Lanterns tear up the hearts of their victims. The part ends with the Black Hand declaring they will not escape death this time when two dead heroes get Black Lantern's rings and rise. Part 2 opens up on the Atom, still trying to get hold of Hawkman. Now, with a second line, Black Lantern Hawkman tells the Atom to come over and talk. We then move to Gotham. We see James and Barbara Gordon waiting by the bat signal, hoping for anything, anyone to arrive and help Gotham out. Hal Jordan smashes onto the bat signal, causing great commotion. We then move back to Aquaman's grave. Atlanteans have come for their king's body, only to be attacked by the Black Lantern Aquaman. From there, we are introduced to another major character in the story, Deadman. Deadman is curled up on his own grave, hearing the voices of the Black Lantern rings and begging that his body won't be used and will remain under the soil. Unfortunately for Deadman, it 
does take a black lantern ring and bursts through the ground. During this time, the original hawk, Dun Horsegrave, is somehow protected from the black lantern rings. They cannot claim his corpse. Only for his younger brother, Hank Hall, the second hawk, to take the black lantern ring. And once again, we go back to Mira and Aqualad. Aquaman is now joined by Tula and Dolphin, both black lanterns, to help him out to try and defeat Aqualad and Mira. We jump to Deadman's Grave. This time, it is surrounded by DC supernatural characters. The Phantom Stranger, Blue Devil, Santana, and the Spectre. They are attacked by the Black Lantern Pariah. He is then destroyed by the Black Hand to claim Crispus Allen and the Spectre under the Black Lantern. The Spectre becomes a Black Lantern, declaring he wants Hal Jordan back. It is quite shocking that a Angel and of God has become a Black Lantern. It's shown how incredibly powerful these Black Lantern rings are. Anyway, and we're back to Gotham. Black Lantern, Martian Manhunter is Jason the Flash. And the Gordons are dealing with the Green Lantern, which is of course Hal Jordan. Mira and Aqualad are fighting the undead, and here we learn that unlike your average zombies, decapitation doesn't work. Actually, nothing really works, even when using the living weaknesses when they were living weakness against them. Mira manages to escape the fight after being blown off the top of the lighthouse. Uh, this is straight after Aqua's lad's heart is torn out and becomes a black lantern with Aquaman, Dolphin and Tula. In Gotham, the fight between the Flash and the Martian Manhunter is getting intense. Now, the Flash causes a vortex when Hal Jordan causes a fire using a police car and several chemicals the Flash put down. Is it is here that we see that Martian Manhunter of the Black Lanterns does not have his weakness to fire. He is absolutely immune and he doesn't get hurt. Anyway, that's part one of the Blackest Knights Lord Deep. That's not even a deep dive, it's just going through it and talking about it. And telling the story. It's a fantastic story and I really do enjoy it. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, part two will be up next week. And then we'll part three as well. There is a poll if you want me to talk about the other stories in the Blackest Night series, such as the Superman, Batman, and all the others. And, well, have you read Blackest Night? What did you think of it? Do you think it's better than Marvel Zombies, or do you think it's not as good? Anyway, leave a comment down below, like and subscribe. As always, I do five videos a week to Tabletop Lore. One five one top five one comic law and of course my Monday my Monday morning thoughts. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. I hope you all have a great day and I'll see you all very soon. Bye bye.